we're broadcasting. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being patient with us and waiting for us. We've had one or two technical issues this morning, but that notwithstanding, we're live and we're here. My name is Vusi Tembogwayo. I will be the facilitator of the session for the next few hours. And I'm joined by a phenomenal panel of thinkers, business leaders, academics, who are going to be sharing with us perspectives about the single question. What must African business do to play its part in the rebuild of Africa, the continent, the brand, and of course, the resurfacing of brand perception. We start first in an area which is my own favorite area of focus and expertise, and that is small business and startups. So what must small business and startups do to really have a place in the global economic round table called the global economy? To address us on this, we've got Shiv Kemka, who's the vice president of SUN Group, He's coming right in from Zurich in Switzerland, and he's going to be talking to us about young Africans and what young Africans must be empowered and enabled to create their own businesses. So I'm quite looking forward to hearing um, Shiv's thoughts. Shiv, thank you so much for joining us. Lucy, thank you very much. What's the weather like in Switzerland? Sorry? What's the weather like over there? The weather is cold. It snowed last week. Uh, and uh, it's crisp and cold and sunny today, but uh, it's, I can see we're heading into the winter. I, I can tell you in sunny Joburg, where I am, it's lovely, it's sunny, um, there's greenery outside. It's really a quintessential African spring day. You, you really are in the wrong part of the world. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think so. I, I, I'm jealous. Yeah. So for those joining us, here is the question I would like for you to think about as Shiv runs us through his thoughts over the next few minutes. And the question is this, Ricardo, you have, I would like for you to, as an entrepreneur, how do you define your business goals? Has your approach towards entrepreneurship changed during the pandemic? And so that's the question I would like for you to think about. As an entrepreneur, how do you define your, your, how do you define your business goals? And has your approach towards entrepreneurship changed during this pandemic? Shiv, with that intro, over to you. Thank you very much, Busi. Uh, thank you to the organizers. I'm delighted to be here on a very important and interesting topic. Um, you know, the African brand, uh, we all know, does not reflect the greatness of Africa, the great potential of Africa. And when one looks to it, at it through the Western media lens or the global media lens, one always sees the problems, the issues, and, and there, are the, there, there are those problems, but honestly, the opportunities and the tremendously talented uh, population of Africa is not given its fair due. And I think it's time now for us to change all of that. And with a very young population in Africa, I come from India, and we have similarly a very young population. Uh, you know, the population of Africa is similar to the population of India. And so in a way, I feel a kindred association with uh, Africa and the tremendous opportunity that lies ahead for Africa to really create uh, growth for the planet uh, at a moment when the planet is struggling. Um, I want to start off by talking a little bit about small business versus startups because all small businesses, uh, you know, aren't startups and we should be a little bit clear about that uh, because I think that there can be lots of small businesses that are in traditional sectors, doing good work, creating employment and so on. But when we talk about startups, we're really talking about technology connected, technology enabled companies that can grow at tremendous rates as the whole economy shifts on the planet to the fourth industrial revolution with you know, digital technologies, IoT, big data, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and so on. So, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for Africa to play in this, and particularly for the young people in Africa to really grasp the bull by the horns and to take this leadership, to take this on. Um, unfortunately, entrepreneurship in that context of small business, uh, meaning startups, uh, has been historically centered in a few global hubs, Silicon Valley being the quintessential hub and then you move from there to Shanghai, Bangalore, Tel Aviv, uh, you know, Stockholm, etc. There are a few hubs where this 
tech entrepreneurship has really flourished. And I think for the first time last year, 55% of venture capital for the first time in history happened outside the United States globally. Sure. And so that means that that is a trend and that's going to accelerate over the next few years. We feel we can see that in India. India has done well in places like Bangalore, but many other smaller cities in India have been left out of this tremendous acceleration in innovation and creativity. India needs to create 1.2 million jobs a month. I'm sure Africa needs to create a similar number of jobs per month, if not more. And given the situation with COVID, given the situation with the slowdown in the global economy, the question is, how are we going to do that? And to me, there's some fundamental pillars to doing that. The first is our education systems. Our education systems, unfortunately, are often focused on the past and not on the future. The curricula are old. The methodologies, the pedagogies are old. And I think new technologies and uh, online uh, access to content means that this can all be shaken up and is being shaken up. And you can today you know, go on to edX or on to you know, Coursera, take courses on computer programming or anything you like. And it's really a very interesting world, uh, particularly for those on the right side of the digital divide. So I think for governments, getting the digital divide you know, broken where everyone actually has access to the internet, to online broadband uh, you know, capabilities is very important. Beyond that, I think appropriate uh, guidance on how to access the tremendous education resources on the planet is very important. So to me, the first thing is education. The second part of it is really a mindset and a mindset that says, I don't want a job, I want to create jobs because I really worry that in the next 10 years, we need to create a billion jobs on the planet for a number sure. of reasons. How are we going to do that if we don't actually change the mindset of young people from wanting to take jobs to wanting to create jobs, we're not going to get there. And so we at uh, uh, Tegelf and at Sun are organizing something we did for the first time last year, which our partners in Saudi called the Entrepreneurship World Cup. We're now, it's now called the Entrepreneurship Sports Generation. It's a broader, more inclusive uh, kind of uh, structure, which uh, we hope to get about 150 to 200,000 entrepreneurs online uh, and work with them. Uh, we are giving away about three to five hundred million dollars of uh, rewards um, in different capacities. And it's about really starting up and catalyzing the global entrepreneurship ecosystem to start to move at scale and to connect the dots. Because these days it's very important to know, are you wasting your time repeating something that's already being discovered somewhere else and already being done somewhere else? Or are you really doing something at the edge of innovation or execution? Are you copying good ideas and making them better in your context? Or are you actually pushing ideas forward and doing new things with teams uh, and uh, you know around the world? And that's now possible. So we're very excited about our project. It's called the Entrepreneurship Sports Generation, ESGX.global. Please go to it for all entrepreneurs. Sign up, join the entrepreneurship ecosystem. That's the second th thing I'd like to say. The third thing I'd like to say is it's all about sustainability. It's all about doing the right thing, taking the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into core focus and being an entrepreneur that's conscious, following conscious entrepreneurship to create positive change for our local communities, for our countries, for our continents, for our planet. And I think that is what's needed. Unfortunately, you know, our generation and the generation before did many good things but we weren't particularly focused on sustainability and you know the environmental damage that exists on the planet is testament to that. So I think it's an extremely exciting moment. We are working in many African countries at the moment. We want to work in every African country uh, and we are very, very excited to be part of this uh, event and, how, and to put our shoulder behind, trying to work to see how can we make Africa shine? How can we make brand Africa shine? And I really believe it's about young people and entrepreneurship and, you know, getting the gender uh, equality on, on, on the planet right. And Africa has many, many women entrepreneurs who are very impressive. And that's something we need to showcase to the world. 
So those are a few comments from my side, and I look forward to the question and answer session. That's some that's some some riveting thoughts there. I mean, I think there's so many takeouts. This thing about a billion jobs in the next ten years. I mean, that's a hell of a thought when you consider that we're also moving into an era of hyper-connected technologies where the world is becoming increasingly more efficient, right? So, so actually our, our drive for jobs then is going to be interesting because we're also moving into an era where the, the, the search for profit in industry is not necessarily driven by labor. Absolutely, Gusi, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, McKinsey estimates that $15 trillion of existing jobs is going to be automated and taken over by AI within the next 10 years. Now, that's a huge number on a planet where the total GDP is 100 trillion. So 15% of the GDP is gonna move from labor-oriented jobs to uh, automated jobs. And what that means is that there will be tremendous opportunities, but it means that the young people need to be trained to understand the type of opportunities and how to take advantage of them. If you are living in the old world, you won't make that transition, whether you're young or old, and that worries me a lot. And so I think it's extremely important to create a global ecosystem that supports each other during this time to learn together, to work together, to bring best practices together and do things together, and to create an, a kind of sportified environment. So what we're doing is actually making entrepreneurship like a sport. Everyone loves sport, everyone connects to sport. It's not a sort of ivory tower where a few people can access uh, the mm. sort of benefits of entrepreneurship, where everyone should be part of the ecosystem, everyone should participate, and everyone should learn together, whether you're young or old, uh, you know, whatever, you know, caste, creed, religion uh, you are. It's about us doing it all together, because I think the planet deserves that today. And just one final uh, question, and then I'll, I'll move on. We'll come back, you and I, and, and exchange some more thoughts on this later. But there's also a question then about the asymmetry of opportunity, right? Because one of the things about technology is that it is borderless. So if you're, great, if you're getting these massive technologies all over the world that are shifting the way consumers behave, the way firms buy, the way markets are constructed, um, and the way distribution chains actually work, value chains actually work, but they're coming from a few concentrated hubs, it means that there is an asymmetry in terms of the allocation of resources and profits. This is your comment about the flow of venture capital and then therefore the return of where that capital is then domiciled with the need for jobs, right? And so you, if we're not careful, the question I'm posing to you is, if we're not careful, is it possible that we end up with a world that is even more unequal and even more asymmetrical? because we've not channeled with deliberately uh, the, the use of technology and how technology enables economic participation. I think it's a huge challenge and a huge risk, uh, Gusi. I think uh, it worries me. The degree of inequality already is worrying. 8% of the planet's population shares 83% of the planet's wealth, according mm. to the World Economic Forum. That's clearly not a sustainable model. Uh, we need to find ways to spread the wealth around, spread the jobs around, the entrepreneurial energy around. Uh, I think that, yes, there is a concentration around, you know, the fang and the bat companies, as they're called. Uh, they're getting bigger and stronger every day. But I think around them, huge ecosystems can be created and can develop that can also benefit. But it's about actually uh, understanding how those ecosystem work, ecosystems work and how one can participate in them. And uh, there's a lot to do. I love Peter Diamandis's book, Abundance, which says there's plenty for everyone, uh, but we need to know how to harness it and use it together. Uh, and I love Gandhiji's phrase. Mahatma Gandhi's birthday was just last week, and uh, he's been a great um, a sort of hero of mine. And he said that the world has created enough for our needs, but not enough for our grief. And so I think mm. it's very important for us now to think about consciously and that's why i talk about conscious entrepreneurship how do we actually lift the the the, the, the overall entrepreneurship ecosystem for everyone not just for a few absolutely love it we're going to leave it there we'll come back and we'll exchange some more thoughts thank you so much um uh, for those for those short for those thoughts uh, Chief Kemp. i really appreciate it next Thanks, it Lucy. gives me great pleasure to welcome now 
um, Busisiwe Mavoso, who's the CEO of Business Leadership South Africa. Busisiwe, I take it you're in Joburg like me, so welcome to the platform. And Busisiwe will be talking about continental economic integration and the global economic integration. So what must African economic powerhouses such as South Africa and Nigeria be doing to drive and help continental economic um, integration? But of course, before Busisiwe starts, We'll see, we're going to start with a quick video. There's always a few awkward moments. Uh, before something like this happens. So, uh, Ricardo, Vin, can you guys just give us that intro video for Busisiwe and then we'll get going. See, I wonder, I wonder if you and I shouldn't just carry on with it. It seems that they might interfere with our, our technical team at the back. So, so are you coming in from Jobo? Yes, I am. Excellent. Yeah. So, We'll see over to you. I will let you get going with your thoughts. Brilliant. So thank you very much, Vusi, uh, and um, thank you to the African Friends Summit for organizing this very critical event where we as Africans have to look at what are some of the things that we actually have to do to better position ourselves as a continent. And maybe let me first start by acknowledging that we are having this conversation during a critical time when we as the world are confronted with what we last saw in the 1930s during the Great Depression. So we've been thrown one of the most wicked curveballs in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think what makes it more wicked in our case is that it finds us at our weakest as a country. And in the South African context, I think all of us also know that uh, the economic outlook for 2020 was already bleak at the beginning of the year with a projected 0.3% growth. And at the beginning of this month, we posted very bleak unemployment data where we recorded 2.2 million, uh, this was actually just last week, 2.2 million jobs lost in the second quarter of the year. And this came right after the shocking quarter two annualized 51% negative economic growth. So in approximately just seven months, COVID-19 has unravelled much of the progress that we've made over the last, uh, I think about, what, 25 years, uh, 26 years now, and has definitely exacerbated the weaknesses of the last 10 years. And I think where we are, let's agree that we have all acknowledged that at least from the COVID-19 crisis, two things are certain. The first one being that life as we know it will never be the same again, and in this regard, People refer to the new normal, and we've got an obligation, therefore, as leaders, both business and government, to say, what does this new normal mean in the African context, and how do we actually give effect to it? And secondly, we have all realized how COVID-19 has revealed the fragility of global supply chains, which presents a great opportunity for localization. So from an African business perspective, this means we need to be more inwardly focused uh, from a value chain perspective and from a regionalization perspective. So as a result of the economic impact posed by the disruption in supply chains, we are seeing a lot of economies focusing on localization to deal with the risks of being dependent on imports and on being dependent on China, you know, which is very central to this. So the continent in this regard uh, presents opportunities to develop the new African Continental Free Trade Area Corridor. 
the continent definitely presents opportunities for greater regional cooperation, as well as increased localization via the accelerated rollout of the African continental free trade area. Now we've been talking about this African continental free trade area uh, decision made in 2012. And for me, it's very disappointing that eight years later, you know, we are still talking about it. It is still a theory and we still haven't actually implemented it. But one of the main focuses, if we are trying to achieve the continental economic integration, ought to be dropping the trade barriers between African countries, which would mm -hmm. definitely boost trade on the continent by over 50%, according to some estimates. So the Africa's free trade area can be one of our most important tools for Africa's economic recovery. Our goal as a continent right now ought to be to establish a single market for goods and services. Let's allow the free movement of business travelers and investments. Let's create a continental customs union to streamline trade and attract long-term uh, uh, investments. And some of the low-hanging fruit in this regard, for me, Vusi, and some of the opportunities that we need to be exploring need to be uh, looking at how do we start working on unlocking trade with the West and the East, Africa's biggest economies. And from a West Africa perspective, uh, there is a sea corridors opportunity, you know, from Cape Town, Walvis Bay, Lagos, Accra, and from an East Africa perspective, there is the rail and road corridors that we need to be exploiting, which actually range from Jobet, Lusaka, Dar es Salaam, and, 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 and Nairobi. So to stress the importance of this continental agreement, I think we all remember that our own South African president, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, once said, a free trade area for Africa is going to be like a flood, a flood that is going to lift all the boats. It is not just about South Africa, it is more about the broader continent. And all uh, uh, countries of Africa participating, big and small, are definitely going to benefit from this. So I'm really busy trying to position the role, you know, that we ought to be playing, but more importantly that the African business must play uh, in terms of the continental economic integration and the global economic integration. And in this regard, you know, uh, building more links among African countries is essential for the continent's economic progress. And at this point, maybe let me look at what the two African economic powerhouses, which are South Africa and Nigeria, can actually do to assist. So we all know that in the African continent, these are obviously the two largest economies, Together, we account for around a third of the gross domestic product of the African continent. The size of our domestic markets also means that we account for a higher proportion of the intra-African trade. And South Africa is obviously by far the biggest contributor to the intra-African uh, 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 trade, you know, in as far as goods are concerned. So clearly, the benefits of an integrated continental market would be significantly diminished without these two African economic powerhouses. So mm -hmm. from a South African perspective, we have played a dominant role in regional dynamics in the South and Africa, strongly influencing the regional agendas of SADC in areas such as energy infrastructure, trade, peace and security. And uh, we definitely, you know, uh, 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 agree that our economy is large, it's well diversified, it's technologically advanced, it's better integrated into the global economy, and we, as South Africa, have definitely become one of the largest investors in Africa, particularly, you know, through our large and comparatively advanced uh, retail and uh, telecom telecommunications, financial services sectors, you know, amongst others. On the other hand, Nigeria's abundance of oil and gas resources is a key factor to the success of the Africa's free trade area. So from a South African perspective, and I think probably maybe let me hold on to this maybe for a later conversation, Bosi, because I need us to look at how do we actually explore, you know, the role that African businesses can actually play, you know, to achieve this economic integration that we're talking about. And I really would like to look at how do we position South Africa business, not just African business, but South Africa business in particular, you know, to can start contributing meaningfully, uh, meaningfully to the continental agenda. And, you know, to this end, there are obviously certain policy shifts that are required to assist some of South Africa's businesses to meaningfully come to the party. So there is a lot that needs to be done in terms of ensuring that the environment within which we are operating as African businesses, not just South Africa, is actually
actually made more fertile and more conducive. And I think in discussing this topic, we would be doing disservice and the conversation would definitely be incomplete without looking at how do we really achieve this accelerated African continental free trade area, you know, and how do we ensure that the agreement is implemented with speed, but implementing the agreement is but one aspect. You know, there is still a big part that needs to be done around, you know, ensuring that we achieve a, a, a conducive environment to position African businesses. And as I'm saying, I think I'd rather get to that discussion later. But I think from an opening remarks perspective, Busi, allow me to pause there and uh, looking forward to the great engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Busi. We'll probe a bit further and then we'll, we'll move on to the, to the next set of opening thoughts. So at a, at a simple layman level, what are the real barriers to this integration um, of the African economies? What are the real, actual, on the ground barriers? You know, as I'm saying that, the decision to establish the continental free trade area was taken in 2012. So it is actually very frustrating and disappointing that eight years later we still haven't implemented it. So I think a big part of it, the way we're seeing in the South African context, but I think in the broader African context as well, you know, there is this issue of political will in terms of what are some of the things that we need to do, especially from a policy perspective, to try and position ourselves as a continent, you know, uh, 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 to be the, you know, uh, attractive investment destination, as it were. You know, if we were to be serious about uh, dealing with some of these policy restraints, if we were to be serious about accelerating, you know, some of these interventions that are actually going to position us as a continent, then we are potentially sitting on an economic block of combined GDP of 3.4 trillion rand, you know, actually not rand, US dollars. So that is what we could be unlocking. So I'd also probably at this point, would like to, you know, I think throw in the fact that Africa is poor by choice. You know, uh, we, we, we are not from a resources perspective, from a potential perspective, from an attractiveness perspective, um, from a positioning perspective, from a market perspective, which is about 1.3 billion people, we shouldn't be sitting as one of the, you know, most poorest continents, you know, in the world. So we are where we are, precisely because our leaders, both business and political, are not what they ought to be. So I think there is this lethargy, you know, that we seem to assume, you know, when we actually have to implement some of these critical decisions that are actually going to move our continent and definitely our economy forward. And I think these are some of the things and honest conversations that we actually have to have, because honestly, uh, 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 I don't think there's anything that I can point to, you know, that I'm saying is actually uh, blocking the implementation of this trade deal, you know, and once this trade de uh, deal is concluded, it is actually going to be one of the biggest trade deals, you know, in the world. So if we are sitting on that dynam or, 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 or on that pot of gold, as it were, do we therefore need to be waiting for a China, you know, to come and uh, assist in terms of revitalizing our economy, you know, and our, and, and, and my view is that definitely not. So why are we therefore not doing it for ourselves when we have everything going, you know, from an African uh, uh, perspective? So from where I'm sitting, it's really a function of political will and us better organizing ourselves, you know, as African leaders uh, and, and, and being uh, more intentional and deliberate about uh, emancipating ourselves from an economic perspective. It's interesting, and just as a final thought, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, that the, the many big businesses have been doing this, right? So if you think about the foraying of South African businesses into many other parts of the continent, with or without success is not the point. The point is that they have looked at the continent and recognized that there is huge economic potential. Um, but of course, then there is a need to talk about what does that exchange look like? So do we... How do we integrate the continent, not only in terms of the economic opportunity from a retail and spend perspective, but also from a manufacturing perspective, so that the, the continent broadly then is reindustrialized, particularly where there's been a massive deindustrialization? 
and, 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 and the, the question I want to ask you is this. Do you think the global capital markets is ready to lubricate a free trade environment in Africa? Do you think there is enough money out there to fund and finance economic expansion of African firms in Africa to drive uh, African growth for African consumers? What would be your thought on that? I think there definitely is, Busi. Uh, capital will go where there, will, where there is two things and two things only. They will go where there is a market and from a market perspective, we are definitely there. I'm talking about 1.3 billion people and fastly growing. And they'll definitely go where there's potential to make profit. Now, if you look at this positioning, I don't think there are a lot of a, 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 a continents, you know, that can actually say that they've got these two things going for them. So the reason, therefore, why we are actually not getting our fair share of the capital allocation that actually exists in the global space is precisely because, you know, of the, un the, the, the environment that is not conducive, you know, to, 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 to actually invest in the, in, the, in, the, in the African continent. We know very well, for instance, from our own environment in the South African perspective, there is a lot of, we talk a lot, we'll see about the structural economic reforms that we need to be implementing. And I think it is unfortunate that even when we are sitting in this dire position, as South Africa in particular, and I'd like to make an example using South Africa, when we are sitting in an environment where we are at the precipice, you know, from an economic crisis perspective, yeah. you know, we have already presented the economic recovery strategy as social partners to the president on the 15th of September, it's three weeks later we are yet to hear an iteration from the president around what direction of travel are we actually going to take as a country. We've been talking about these things long before this crisis hit. So let's agree that as South Africa, we shouldn't be sitting where we're sitting. Let's agree that the economic woes that we are actually facing as a country are actually is as a result of a lot of own goals that we have scored. Let's agree that we shouldn't be sitting as, you know, a sub-investment grade country. You know, let's agree that our positioning as the most advanced economy in the continent, you know, shouldn't be landing us where we are. You know, we are actually overtaken by a lot of other you know, a, a, a countries that are actually doing much more better from a positioning perspective and from con a, a, a creating that conducive environment. So I think the answer to your question, Busi, is that we definitely are there in as far as these two things are concerned, which is what capital is looking for if they are going to invest their money. But I think we are just failing, you know, from ensuring that we get our house in order so that we position ourselves from an attractiveness perspective. And this is where I think we are letting not only ourselves down, but the 1.3 billion people that are in this continent that are relying on us as leaders, you know, to actually ensure that we can actually, you know, uh, be self-sufficient and provide, you know, for our people as, 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 a, as, as a region and definitely as a continent. Love it. Thank you so much, uh, Musi. So riveting thoughts. And we'll come back to those. I want to I want to double click on those, and I, I wanted to also see if we can find an intersection between the integration of the African Economic Trade Block with the global ride of new startups, and how and how we create spaces where we're not only reindustrializing old economies, but we're also participating in the new and emerging economies and technologies that are taking the, the world by storm. So thank you so much for those thoughts. I want to, if I can now, invite Hanan. Uh, Hanan, I know we've had some technical issues uh, before you joined us. I wonder if I wonder if you're there now. There you are. How are you, Hanan? I'm okay. Good morning. Thank you. Great. So, so what we're going to do, Hanan, I know that you've got a, a short presentation that you'll be showing us, and maybe it might be worth the while for us to see how we better manage that presentation so that we don't have the lag out of signal. For those of you joining us and watching this conversation, just to note that we have had one or two technical issues, so just be a bit patient with us if there is a lag in signal. Hanan is uh, the Director of African Economic Outlook at the African Development Bank, and she's going to be talking to us about the African Economic Outlook and brand perception. So what are the key strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats 
that we see in the short and the medium term that we really could leverage to reinvigorate productivity across the board and place, and place value on brand Africa. And I'm, I'm gonna, before you start, where are you coming in from? Where are you based? Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. Abidjan, one of my favorite parts of the continent. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Hanan. Hanan, over to you. Okay, very good. Are we able to start with the slides or should we? Absolutely. Okay, uh, the, the team can bring the presentation up, please. So um, I'm going to uh, give you an overview on the African Economic Market, the Met Harvest, and the opportunities and the challenges. So uh, next, please. So uh, COVID is, uh, you know, like the no other crisis we've seen in recent history. Uh, it has the uh, in the global economy is uh, a shock that is. Um, Okay, so it's not a localized shock like financial sector crisis where the global financial crisis was, was just affecting one sector. In this case, you have a uh, shock that emanated in the health sector, but it's really affecting sectors across the economy. Uh, and um, COVID is uh, a expected to actually um, reverse the uh, Africa uh, strong growth trajectory that we have seen recently. So due to the fluidity of the situation uh, and the uncertainty, we uh, basically consider two scenarios. Um, a baseline scenario where um, you know, the crisis have a substantial impact, uh, but of shorter duration until the um, first half of 2020. Of course, we know that this is now, you know, we are beyond that. And then a worst case scenario where it's the impact is deeper and goes beyond that first half. And I think, you know, we are based on how things are evolving, we're closer to that worst case scenario. And based on these scenarios, we uh, basically project that uh, growth will contract uh, by 1.7% uh, in 2020 under the baseline and by 3.4% uh, under the worst case scenario. Um, and we expect the recovery for next year to be between 2.4% and 3%. Uh, it's very important to highlight the, the, the high degree of uncertainty surrounding projections, given also the risks uh, related to um, uh, a potential second outbreak of COVID, um, um, continued uh, uh, shock to commodity prices, um, issues related to um, social unrest because of the impact of the pandemic. So these are all risks surrounding and challenges surrounding the plan. Next, please. Uh, it's it's uh, important also to keep in mind that um, the, the shock of the crisis uh, impact uh, um, varies significantly across countries and across regions. And the, uh, this is, uh, Basically, in this shock, uh, this time the continent is hit by multiple shocks. So you have a, a health uh, a shock that is affecting everyone. You have a commodity a price shock that is affecting all the commodity exporters. And then you have also um, um, a sharp declines in food revenue receipts and remittances receipts, receipts, which affect many countries, as well as a, um, you know, impact on um, reversals of capital flows. So uh, basically what uh, our projections show is that the economies that would be most hit are those that are tourism dependent economies and oil exporters. Uh, we expect these, com these um, uh, countries to actually be hardest hit in the crisis. And across regions, um, actually the, uh, the, the region that Comes as the uh, most resilient uh, is the uh, East African uh, region. It's the only region that, under both scenarios, still remain um, uh, the, the average growth still remains positive. In the worst case scenario, it's closer to zero, but still positive territory. 
uh, and this is due to um, you know broad di economic diversification of uh, that region and also it's the region that had strong uh, growth dynamics prior to the crisis uh, the uh, kind of the uh, worst uh, uh, hardest hit is really the southern africa region um, so we this is the, the region that will be uh, they will be uh, affected uh, the most and it's, it's the, the impact would be the, the um, a contraction of 4.9 percent and 6.6 percent next uh, of course the this uh, crisis has an impact on uh, macroeconomic fundamentals so uh, you know we, we, there, there will be uh, deterioration in macroeconomic fundamentals um, uh, fiscal deficits are um, uh, expected to uh, to rise so on average fiscal deficits um, uh, we're around 4.4 percent 4.4 percent of gdp for last year and we expect that to uh, reach to almost double to eight uh, percent on average for the company uh, this of course because of pressures both on the revenue side uh, with lower economic activity the revenue to the government will be um, affect, uh, affected but also because of the the expenditure pressures because many um, African countries need to spend more to save lives and livelihood. Um, so uh, that would lead to this increase in uh, fiscal deficit. And uh, as a consequence, we also expect that this will affect the debt levels in the company, uh, which had already been high before uh, the crisis. So we expect the uh, uh, average uh, debt to GDP level to rise from 16% on average to 70% um, compared to other. We also um, expect that there will be deterioration in external activities uh, due to um, uh, issues of this uh, uh, collapse in commodity prices, but also uh, affected by the uh, disruptions in um, foreign direct investment and in prices. Next. Uh, what's more, uh, even more important is that um, COVID will have serious implication uh, on on welfare aspects and uh, uh, poverty in the country. Uh, so we uh, actually estimate that extreme poverty uh, will uh, increase uh, due to COVID, uh, and that it uh, translates into 49 million um, Africans being put into extreme poverty. Um, so this uh, really kind of rests heavily making a lot of progress that the continent, the hard turn is that the continent has made towards um, achieving the safe water that we need. Uh, and this is a concern. Uh, another issue also is this is going to affect just creation. So um, an estimated 25 to 30 million jobs could be lost. And particularly, this will affect uh, um, youth and vulnerable group and women. So um, this also remains an area that we need to be vigilant about in terms of um, what type of measures to take. Uh, next slide. And so, of course, given the, the uh, you know severity of the crisis and the nature of it. Uh, it's very important to have the right uh, uh, policies to uh, make sure that uh, you know, save lives and livelihoods. So in terms of in the health sector, there needs to be prioritization of health spending, um, ensuring that it creates the capacity of the uh, health sector to be able to contain the pandemic. Uh, on the macroeconomic side, fiscal policy really need to be targeted toward uh, protecting the most uh, uh, the, the poor and most vulnerable so we're targeted social safety nets and uh, supporting both the uh, 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 targeted support to uh, viable businesses to subsidy and tax reliefs um, however the challenge here is uh, for policy makers is the issue of high informality in the country so uh, the typical uh, policy instruments are much harder to really uh, use um, because you know 
how do you reach the informal sector? Uh, there are a number of African countries that are now um, uh, trying to uh, basically uh, find way and uh, digital ways of identifying how to reach to this um, you know, informal sector and the most vulnerable there. And this will be really important to make sure that um, these are um, you know, uh, cost-effective, well-targeted to create a content and has uh, rather unlimited quality effects. So we need to make sure that we are getting um, you know, the most out of what we are spending and we are um, directing that spending to uh, you know, the most uh, useful ends. In terms of the monetary response, uh, the, the key issue here is to really make sure that we need to meet financial um, uh, conditions uh, and uh, uh, avoid these liquidity shortages. Uh, and to basically uh, avoid to see viable businesses that are experiencing liquidity issues, so that liquidity issues we can turn into a solvent issue. So that will be really key. Um, finally, next. Uh, it's, uh, I, I wanted to perhaps um, you know, um, conclude my thoughts with uh, highlighting that despite that the continent now is facing uh, these difficult uh, challenges, uh, we need to also keep uh, um, our eye you know, on, on the goal and the direction that the, the, the continent has uh, abundant uh, um, you know, opportunities um, and we need to make sure that you know, the, the saying never uh, give a crisis uh, uh, go to waste. So I think this is an opportunity to actually make sure that the recovery for the continent is a resilient, more inclusive and sustainable one. Um, and we need to remember that you know, the, the uh, continent has uh, many of the fastest growing economies. Just last year, six out of 10 fastest um, economies in the world were from the continent, African countries. Uh, we also need to remember that by uh, to keep in this gap, by uh, 2035, seven of every 10 new entrants to the labor market will be Africans. While the whole world will be aging, Africa is only getting younger. So this is a huge asset that the continent would really need to utilize to make sure to prepare that uh, these uh, new entrants and youth, uh, you know, to kind of prepare them well for the, uh, you know, the in the fourth industrial revolution, the global trends, to basically make sure uh, to be well prepared to meet the demographic dividend of this uh, trend. Another, another issue also is the, um, the opportunities that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement offers for larger market um, uh, across the continent. And finally, and this is an area that also my uh, other speech, uh, uh, earlier speaker have raised, which is very important, that there are opportunities now with the, in, with, with the with COVID and how it translated into many companies wanting to diversify their, their risk in terms of supply chain, not just have it concentrated in Asia or China. This is a great opportunity for the continent to actually um, integrate into these global supply chains uh, and uh, you know benefit from it. So I'll stop here. I will. I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Three. I wasn't being rude. I wanted to make sure that we didn't hold up your signal uh, on the side of the presentation. I love the thoughts that you've shared. I mean, I think there's so much to take out of that, right? So this idea of a fiscal deficit that's expected to double in 2020, um, and that the sector's most, most expected, the economy's most expected to be affected are those that are tourism and oil driven. I think there's so much for us to dive into there. And what I will do a bit later on when we have our panel discussion is I want to see if I can tether your thoughts with what is the thought around what do we need to do as a continent, broadly all of us to work together. So thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. And uh, we'll have you back on the platform in a minute.
let's let's move on now. And I am uh, looking forward to the next presentation as well. We've got um, Terry Boyson, who's going to be joining us. And uh, Terry is going to be talking to us about corporate Africa and whether or not we should take the two um, more seriously. Now, what I'd like to do is to invite some participation. I should have done this earlier, admittedly, I apologize. But I'd like to invite some participation, and here's how it goes. So first, you get your phone, no matter where you are, and you go to menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I dot com. M-E-N-T-I dot com. And it will ask you for a passcode. And what we're going to do now is we will show the passcode live on the ticker tape as I'm speaking. And the passcode is 16209671620967. 16209671620967. If you enter the passcode onto the platform, it'll direct you to where we are having our conversation and you can, and you can answer the questions as they're asked there. Immediately, you'll find the question that's already on the platform coming up for Terry's presentation. So there's the passcode, 16209671. You go to menti.com, and you'll find Terry's question. And I'm told that the tech team has Terry's question available now. Is that correct? Let's see if we can see it on the screen now. And then I will ask uh, Terry to join us. So, menti.com, 16209671, that's the code that you want to type in. And when you get there, you'll find from each of our speakers, we have a single question that we would like for you to answer for us. So, we, are, uh, we can get your thoughts on, on the thoughts that our speakers are sharing with us. So, Ricardo's queuing the questions now, and Ricardo's going to show us the question that is uh, Terry's question on the screen now. And it's the same question you'll see the minute you log on to um, menti.com. And once you log on to menti.com, that's the question that you will be expected to answer. And it'll help us get a sense of the question. The question, and I'm happy to read it for you, is will sustainability and the overall objective to create a better world be a dominant factor in the African economic development, right? So that's the question. And uh, if you go to menti.com, type in one six. 20967, then uh, that should be ready. Terry, are you here? Can I bring you onto the conversation? It's such a wild thing doing these virtual conferences, right? Because you're talking to someone and you're not sure that they're there. Terry, are you there? Let's see if we can bring Terry into the conversation. But if you read the ticker now, you'll see the question already. Will sustainability and the overall objective to create a better world be a dominant factor in African economic development. Terry Boyson should be ready now, and I'm waiting for our tech team to see if they can bring Terry Boyson into the conversation now. We seem to be having some technical issues with Terry, so what I'm going to do in the interest of time is I'll move on. And the technical team, please, if you would cue me before that I know if the speaker is actually available for the next session or not. Let's move on now, if we can, to Gabor. And I take it Gabor is available for the next session. Again, go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. The PIN you want to type in is 16209671. And when you get there, there is a single question from each of our speakers that you'll be able to ask and answer. Um, or rather answer so that we, we can get feedback from you uh, for each of our speakers to think about, but also to help us frame the next series of conversations that are going to be happening, just to help us frame the next series of conversations that's going to be happening. I'm going to jump to Sol Khumutsamulobi, who's the CEO of Brand Hill Africa. And Sol is going to be talking to us about thinking, reputation, and economic development. How can we... How can corporate Africa integrate considerations for continental image in the way that it does business? And what are some of the negative perceptions associated with doing business in Africa? I can tell you all about that, running a Pan-African VC firm. So we're going to go to Saul now. I note from the technical team that Terry's available, but we'll take Saul now. We'll have Terry later 
um, just so we have consistency in terms of how we're doing this. So, um, Saul, are you ready? I'm ready. Where are you based, Squire? I'm in Johannesburg, in Gauteng. Uh, Excellent. So you are, so you are experiencing that lovely weather. Okay. Um, first things first, uh, just to say why Africa is where it is today. I'm going to quote Thomas Sankara, uh, the first post-independence president of Begina Faso. I open quote, he says, you cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. In this case, it comes from non-conformity, the courage to turn your back on the old formulas and the courage to invent the future. It took the madmen of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today. I want to be one of those men. We must dare to invent the future, close quote. During the turn of the first century, a Roman author, naturalist, and a naval commander, uh, otherwise known as um, Pliny the Elder, said, I quote, ex Africa semper aliquid novi, close quote, which means out of Africa, there is always something new. Fast track to the 1885 Berlin Conference, which was dubbed the, the Scramble for Africa. This marked the imposition of colonialism, which resulted in the deliberate stealing and appropriation of Africa's wealth, the dehumanization and acculturation of Ar Africa's people, and the destruction of their identity. The turn of the 20th century began with Pixley Kaisaka Semes' iconic award-winning speech, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1906 at Cambridge University that planted a seed for the regeneration of Africa and led to the formation of a number of national liberation movements across the continent, starting with the ANC in South Africa in 1912. Then fast forward to 1963, on the 24th of May, Ghana's first post-independence president, Kwame Nkrumah, at a conference in Ethiopia, called for the unification of Africa. The next morning, the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, was launched. This explains why the newly established Secretariat for the Africa Free Continental uh, Trade Agreement is now headquartered in Accra, in Ghana. Then fast forward to 2002, the OAU, under the chairmanship of President Thabo Mbeki, was rebranded the African Union. Now all the 55 AU member states have attained their national liberation, except for the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. Please note the AU member states are 55 and not 54, as the Grand P Morocco would want us to believe. Fast forward to 2019, under the chairmanship of President Cyril Ramaphosa, the AU finalizes the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and it is ratified by the majority of the member states. The first Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement was elected, and he happens to be a South African national, His Excellency, Mr. Wamkwele Kiabetumene. These ladies and gentlemen tell us history isn't happening per chance or it is coincidental. It is a deliberate act made by humankind. To paraphrase Karl Marx in his three ties, the German ideology. The implementation date for the Africa Continental uh, Trade Agreement was initially set for 1 July uh, this year, but as we know, because of the economic lockdowns arising from the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, it was then rescheduled to January uh, next year. 
the AFCFTA integrates Africa into a free trade area of 1.3 billion consumers with a GDP exceeding 2.6 trillion US dollars. This will be the biggest uh, free trade area in the whole world, even bigger than the European Union. But brand Africa remains under siege. On 12 June 2018, President Donald Trump told the world that Africa's countries and Haiti were, excuse me for quoting him verbatim since I'm talking to others, were shithold countries. Simon Holt, a competitive identity architect, wrote, while Germany is known for its engineering, France with cheek, Italy with flair, Sweden with design, Britain with class, Switzerland with precision. Africa is known for its famine, disease, and terror. And I think yesterday some of the speakers alluded to this. Granted, there are numerous challenges the continent is facing, and these include inadequate infrastructure development, roll rate, rail, air, and particularly the ICT sector, which I will sh shortly focus on. Because of this, resulting from the legacy of colonialism, the intra-Africa trade is today still sitting at 14%, according to the World Bank. This means billions of dollars flow out of the continent to pay for the imports made out of the beneficiated uh, commodities that Africa has exported. And in most cases, we pay billions of dollars as licensing fees to the intellectual property owners across the world for those products produced in Africa. Thus, made in Africa isn't synonymous with made by Africa. Then the same brands from abroad are today constituting 86% of the most popular brands in Africa. Where am I saying this? This was said by an annual survey conducted by Brand Leadership Africa, validated by the African uh, uh, Leadership University, that 86% of all the most admired brands in Africa are foreign, meaning only 14% of the brands that we are admiring and celebrating in Africa are homegrown. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development estimates African countries lose $88.6 billion, which is around 3.7% of the continent's GDP, to elicit capital flight annually through a variety of methods, from tax evasion and deliberate misinvoicing of trade shipments to criminal acts such as corruption and fraud. This calls upon us as Africa to invest re sufficient resources in our brand development and management effort. The most cost effective and efficient way is to adopt digital communications platforms as they, as they transcend national and even continental borders. Needless to remind you, these strategic tools are cost efficient too. We have to invest in ICT infrastructure to bridge the digital, digital divide that leaves 22 African countries with internet penetration of less than 20%. So major improvements in communications infrastructure are essential for digital trade to fulfill its potential to create jobs and boost economic growth. I thank you. thoughts there Saul that you were sharing I mean I must confess as a as a self-confessed 
um, free marketeer. Um, any, anytime I find ourselves having a retrospective conversation about how we got here, I, I get quite defensive. But I did enjoy your thoughts, particularly around this idea of when does made in Africa become made by Africa? And just yesterday, I had the privilege of a conversation with a business school dean. I won't, I won't mention their name. I don't have their permission to. We were talking a bit about this very concept, actually, that if you, if you look at South Africa, we've had many innovations that have come out of South Africa. If you look at Africa, we've had several innovations that have come out of Africa. And one of the, one of the tricks we're missing as we're rebuilding our economies for the future and rebranding ourselves for that future is how do we position the way Africa as seen is seen as a participant in the global innovation ecosystem? Not just a recipient of global innovation, but a participant in the global innovation ecosystem. So I have a very pointed question for you. Do you think Africans have the self-imaging and the self-belief to see themselves as meaningful participants in the global economic, um, particularly system as it relates to innovation. What do you think? Um, we we should ascribe that to to the legacy of colonialism. Um, Ngugi Wationgo, a, a Kenyan writer, spoke about the decolonization of the African mind. This is what we, we need to be addressing. Uh, there's a lot of self-hate. Here at home in South Africa, Steve Biko spoke about black consciousness that was intended to liberate uh, Africans and black people in general, psychologically. But again, we need to be part of the fourth industrial revolution because we weren't part of the first three. And I'll give you an example. Professor Chilizu Marwala, uh, the, the principal of University of Johannesburg, got his PhD in artificial intelligence 20 years ago. He came back home. We undervalued him. We underappreciated his talent. And it was only a few years ago when the world began to talk about the fourth industrial revolution that we began to affirm him. And that is why only last year, he was elected as the deputy chairperson of the National Commission uh, on 4IR. Now imagine if we appreciated his talents 20 years ago, South Africa will be far much ahead uh, of the curve. You know, especially if you look at many other countries have been inviting him to come and address many seminars on artificial intelligence. And he was underappreciated here at home. Now, mm. it is important that we need to begin to affirm the skills that we have and mm. also take a conscious decision that indeed we are going to participate in the fourth industrial revolution. Rwanda, a country as small as it is, it is already building a Silicon Valley, which will be Africa's first Silicon Valley. The, this is very, very important, especially for bigger economies like Algeria, South Africa, Nigeria, that we are overtaken by a small country like, like Rwanda. But at the same time, if you look at inter, uh, uh, internet connectivity across the continent, in fact, even though South Africa is the second biggest uh, and the most sophisticated economy in the continent, we are still number eight when it comes to internet connectivity. We are beaten mm -hmm. by countries like Rwanda, Mauritius, you know, we are far way behind. Mm -hmm. Now, that is why it is important that the National Commission uh, on, on 4IR has to invest the necessary resources so that South Africa contribute meaningfully, not only to Africa's digital advancement, but also to participate meaningfully in the global uh, ICT uh, advancements. I mean, I, I hear you and I fully agree with everything you're saying, but it pivots on something that 
is unfortunate is unfortunate for you and I to talk about, which is the self-perception of many Africans. You know, the, the truth is the truth is that we we can't you can't address the issue of economic participation at a global level without addressing the issue of the self-perception of Africans as meaningful participants in the global economic table. And maybe for so long, uh, Wenahumoto, we have believed ourselves to be beggars at the table of economic participation, that we can't even believe amongst ourselves that there are those competent and capable of building a continent that is a meaningful participant. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm a student of, of, of dialectical materialism and and Stuart Hall unpacks it very eloquently. He says, if we are going to define ourselves, we don't have to go back to our roots, but we have to appreciate what we have become as members mm. of the global community. He mm. calls it culture dialectic. And then Vipin Gupta went further to say, Whereas anthropologists came into the continent and they looked at how divergent we were from each other, they looked and some who were progressive came in to say, what are the convergent, um, uh, that is the common areas that unite us. Then he said, we need to understand that as, as dialectic says, that we imbibed international cultures as much as we influenced all these international cultures. Now, today's African personality is totally different from uh, an, Africa, uh, an African personality as defined in the 18th and the 19th century. I am what I am today, uh, but I'm not necessarily what my father was, what yeah. my grandfather was, and what all my four beers were. Yes. And, and once you adopt this dynamic approach to defining who you are, is then that you realize that in fact you are a worthy citizen of the global community. You look beyond the the narrow borders, whether they are national or they are along the demographics, then you transcend those you become a global citizen. Mm. Love it. Thank you so much. We'll come back. I've got a million thoughts firing in my head. And for those of you watching the conversation, just think about everything that we've done here. We've gone from talking about startups and how important startups are in reframing and reprioritizing economic participation of developing economies, even in Africa, by Africans and the rest of the world. Uh, Busi spoke to us about how do we integrate the continent in trade, uh, we've just had a conversation now that reflects not only on our past, but also our perception of self. I mean, it's, we're going so many places, and Hannah gave us some really quantitative, great quantitative analysis about where we are and the impact that COVID is going to have on us. So I'm really looking forward a bit later to the panel discussion on cognizance of time. I don't want to waste too long. I'm going to ask Terry to join us now. Terry, we looked for you a bit earlier. You were not available. But I'm told that you are now available, Squire. How goes it? Uh, very well, thank you. Good to see you. And the team, I hope it's going well for you guys too. All good to go to Hannesburg. Excellent. Excellent. So again, for those of you who are wanting to participate and ask questions, go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. The pin that you want to enter is streaming right now with 1620967. That's 1620967. You'll find their questions from each of our panelists and we would love to get your thoughts. Terry, I'm really looking forward to your, to your thoughts now. You're going to be talking to us about that thing that we don't talk about until we absolutely have to talk about it, corporate governance. I mean, you just, you know, it's just, it's, uh, how do I say this politely? It's not a particularly exciting subject matter. You know, it's just, oh, it doesn't, it, it, and, it's, and it's one of those things that it, it, it isn't until it is. It's not until yeah. things go wrong that everybody goes, hold on, what was happening with corporate governance? And there's so many examples in the recent past about how corporate governance is just at the bedrock of sustainable business development and business growth. So I'm really looking forward to your thoughts 
about should corporate Africa take issues of corporate governance more seriously. He joins us as the CEO of CGF Research Institute right here in Joburg. Please, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Boyce. Thank you. Firstly, thank you, Mr. for warm introduction and some of your kind words and thoughts. I think you know, the starting point for me is uh, simply to, I suppose, go back to some of our own definitions around governance. And you're quite right, it's somehow seen rather mystical in the sense that it's, it, you know, a lot of people tend to think that governance is really that thing, I'll call it a thing, that resides in the boardroom and in the boardroom only. Um, and it's sort of directed to kind of tick box, if you will, you know, some kind of you know, list of, of things to do or even things to say around how well they're governing their organization. But in truth, what we really need to understand is that corporate governance is the system, any system, by which you are directing and controlling. And the way in which you direct and control clearly will vary from one organization to another. But with this being said, I think it's also really important to understand that with governance, we also mean discipline. The discipline of self, the discipline of the connect of the collective. And if you think about it in more personalized terms, if I had to ask you how are you disciplining the structures of your homestead, and then if if you were to make some kind of observation in terms of how I discipline my homestead and how you discipline your homestead, are they the same? Is one right? Is one wrong? Is one better than the other? So if I can start off by saying that, for me, it's important to understand that there are many reports. Now, I was listening to quite a few of the presentations yesterday, but there are a number of reports, um, including materials that prolifically distribute, or are distributed by the social media that talk around you know, the governance of countries and what's going right and what's going wrong, and whether it, or, or, or not we like to believe that they're truthful, in many instances, the perception of people becomes their truth. So from a brand perspective, for me it's important that we understand how to get their traction across Africa to attract the necessary people to come into our continent and obviously in doing so bringing more investment and, and from that investment obviously things materialize from that such as jobs, tickets, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I thought what would be important to do for the purposes of this quick introduction was to maybe make sight um, of the Transparency's International Report 2019-2020. Um, and one of the key things that they pointed out in terms of what we're doing wrong, where we're doing things wrong, and this is all governance related, is the political integrity of our respective governments across the continent. And to that point, what was notable for me was how we're getting this so horribly wrong. And the effects of poor governance of the past decades, and certainly in Africa, being the second largest and fastest growing uh, region uh, on the continent, second to South, South Asia, these were the following headlines that gripped my attention, and I'm sure they'll grip your attention as well. The effects of poor governance, particularly linked into political governance, which clearly has a direct correlation to the economy of our continent and our respective countries, was that, number one, there was still an increasing divide between, an inequality, I guess, between the haves and the have-nots, number one. Number two, there is an increase, a massive increase in unemployment, and we've seen this certainly here in South Africa. There was a continued reduction, this is a, a scary one, a continued reduction in the state's inability to effectively reduce crime. And with crime, Saul's just mentioned it now, we, we talk about corruption as, as one of the subsets, I guess, of crime. That with this, there was increased political instability. And with that instability came the instability and the uncertainty or the mistrust of the subjects of those particular countries, the citizens of the world. There was negative implication to the investment of a country, a region, and, and we've all seen that. And that in terms of many of the countries uh, in the, in the um, African continent, there were continuous downgrades. South Africa alone, as some of you would know, has been downgraded by movies, by fish, by planet and forest, and now we talk about a double downgrade. So the effect of that is obviously having a massive implication on the perceptions of Africa, and of course, 
because of the perceptions of whether or not we're worthy enough continent to invest in it. That's what we talk about capital flight. And these are all really, really critical points in terms of discussing corporate governance. So maybe it's important maybe just to unpack the word corporate when I talk about corporate governance. The, the word corporate is not intended to imply that it would be the governance only made for corporate players, but rather the governance corporately disciplined, collectively done from the top to the bottom, and I guess the sides. And that's where we talk about the horizontal and the vertical governance method. If you look today across most of our leadership on the continent, the question I suppose that needs to be asked is, how often are we actually asking the right questions and are the answers being given to us in a transparent way? To many of our leaders, have we insisted as stakeholders in order to improve the governing of our continent and the governance of our practices, have we asked for lifestyle audits? So that we can see that transparently comparing one leader to another leader, comparing one country's leadership to another country's leadership, transparently that we are generally improving our situation in order to become more attractive for that, that, that elusive um, investment and obviously to increase more you know, traffic into our country, to tourism, etc., etc. And the answer to these questions is no, we haven't been doing it. And if we have been doing it, unfortunately, we haven't been doing it consistently and user concept as a um, effective. So if I look quickly at the Transparency International very latest report, it's interesting that Botswana, against 130, 140 odd countries, uh, worldwide by the way, Botswana has done significantly better than all of us, all right? And they are currently in the ranks of 34 across 150, 150 odd countries. Followed by Rwanda. Interesting if you think about where Rwanda was just 10, 12, 15 years ago, Rwanda is, is trading second, beating Mauritius, Namibia, Senegal, and of course beating South Africa. Right at the bottom of the list in terms of the, the perceptions around poor governance, the perceptions around corruption and, and bribery, right at the bottom is the Congo sitting at 165th. It's the DRC sitting at 168th. And of course, finally, Somalia at 180. Now that doesn't go well. Um, and you know, if you if you look at what's going on, I, I like to you know look at the half glass full as opposed to the half the glass half empty. And I was just saying earlier on in another meeting this morning, which is why I wasn't here earlier on, is that it takes one percent for us to cause change. And if I look at, for example, Somalia, all right, and I'm not singling out any particular one for any particular reason, but how could we take a country like Somalia? How could we take Zimbabwe, as an example, who are currently 158? And with my notion of 1% can cause positive change, like it could cause negative change, but then the glass half full. How can with 1% effort, how could we cause a change to take these countries in Africa that are trailing at the bottom of the perception, bad perception index, and how could we make them better almost overnight? And if you say to me, Terry, you're crazy, well, maybe I am a little bit crazy, but I do agree. And I believe that these things are entirely possible if we were to start tweaking, and I'm using this word cautiously, but tweaking our corporate governance in Africa, tweaking it. In other words, I'm not asking for 100% change and a miraculous overnight recovery that we can now start comparing ourselves to Denmark and to Sweden. No, not at all, all right? And the point I'm trying to make is that this is a journey. And we all, as leaders, as regulators, need to understand the journey of governance that we are. But we can only understand this journey when we make the journey strategic. And right now, truthfully and respectfully, I don't believe that we collectively, as the leadership in Africa, have made governance strategic, ultimately for the sustainability and to thrive and to survive, or rather survive and thrive. We don't just want to survive. We, I heard yesterday the speakers talking about, we want our place at the main table. And I think the quote was, and when they eating steak or caviar, so what we. 
And that's exactly what my aspirations are for this particular um, um, critical initiative of governance across uh, the continent. If I look at just quickly in a seminal paper um, written by, I think it was uh, Dr. John of, of, Par, of Par, I think it was, he said the following, and, I, and I'm not going to quote something, you know, just indulge me quickly if I get here. He said the following, he said, an economy's corporate governance system has significant impact on the profitability and the growth of corporations and that the access to capital and the, and, and the cost of that corporate capital would reduce as you improve your governance. Isn't that phenomenal? I think that's amazing. So with all that being said, that being said, for me, I think that if I look at South Africa at least, there is a growing call, and I'm sure the same thing is applicable to most of the countries in, on the continent. There's this growing call um, in terms of saying we have to understand what governance is, why it's strategic, but at the same time we've got to balance not over-governing, not being over-prescriptive in our organizations, excuse me, and particularly the smaller organizations in a so-called dual economy, the big guys versus the small guys. And let's think about it, folks. The people who are really giving significant numbers of employment are not the major corporations, and dare I say maybe the governments in some countries, it's the SMEs, the small, medium enterprises. And yet what are we doing? We are killing them with burdensome regulation that not even the corporates can get right. Back to my process. Governance doesn't happen overnight. It's a process, and my journey, the system of governance that I'm following, and the system and the journey and the process of governance that you're following, they're different. And so we've got to be careful of over-regulating, over-burdening our, our various organizations that are indeed the, the hub that allows the system to work. And so it allows people to, to get into various businesses, and from a tourism point of view, there too, many small businesses, we are killing them. Or, and or, are we expecting too much of them in the legislative and the regulatory regime that they eventually give up? We can't afford that. To the, just as a matter of interest, to the, to the tenure ship or the, or the longevity or the life, the likelihood, there we go, the likelihood of a small startup company surviving, okay, is if, 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 it, if it makes it past its first two years, it's got a chance of making it to the fifth, to the fifth year. Once it's got past the fifth year, then it's, it's, it's in pretty good shape. But here's a horrible statistic. In South Africa alone, some 43.5% of the smaller companies that we've seen in this year alone, June, to be precise, this year said they didn't know if they were going to make it because of COVID-19. And so I would say that if we were to ease this over-regulation, over-governing, we could actually help them significantly to survive. And of course, the supply chain is obviously would be profitably impacted from that. So for me, a one-size-fits-all in terms of governance, as I, I think my message hopefully is not coming through very clearly, is clearly not an approach I think that we should be adopting. It also talks to the notion of, and many of the African leaders have asked me, uh, both from a governmental and non-governmental point of view, too, should we not be creating our own governance code? And yeah, I, I think about it, and I say to myself, well, it, it does kind of make sense, but if you if you've been listening to me, you would then realize that we're also in a global economy. And maybe there could be some kind of arrogance if we were to say, we will have our own way of doing things, and we will ignore the way that the rest of the world, knowing that we are also dependent on the rest of the world coming to the Mecca of Africa. And if we are indeed, which I believe we are, true global citizens, why can't we then agree to a common code, a common standard, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, so it becomes acceptable to all of us. If I talk like this, it kind of feels like the common law. If the common law says, don't lie, don't cheat, don't defraud, and put the interests of the organization, put the interests of the, of the country first, then surely that's the global order that I might be referring to. I believe it is. So in my mind, good governance and regulatory management is essential. Um, the questions of consequences of good governance, 
They are dire, and are they leading eventually towards a failed state? Now, as I say that, I, I ask myself, there was an old system prior to COVID-19. How many leaders understood the old system? The system of business. The system of attracting foreign investors, foreign investment. Did we truly understand the old system? Starting with the board of directors, if there was such a thing called Africa Incorporate, as though it were a corporation, did all the directors on that board understand governance in the same way? Was it strategic to the sustainability of Africa Inc.? Well, if the answer is no, which I tend to think it is, then do we understand the new system? We've just been listening to Saul talking about OIR, and that, in my comment in that particular talk, we can use OIR and digitize technology to quantum leap many others. Why won't we do that? So do we understand what it's going to take in the new system do we understand how corporate governance can be de facto built into everything we do without over-regulating us? That it becomes effortless. Just imagine a world of effortless discipline. I know, <laughs> Lucy, you might be crying, oh my gosh, effortless discipline. Imagine if you didn't have to discipline your child, and I use that as an analogy, after the age of 10 years old. And there was just this wonderful kid whom you had instilled right values, ethical values, up until the age of 10 years old. Imagine that. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it's entirely possible. And through digitized corporate governance frameworks, we have now had, we have the means, in fact, we're doing it already. We now can see the horizontal and vertical governance of the entire organization, real time, what's going on from the top of the organization to the bottom, to the side, know what's broken, how to fix it, and how to use that to enhance the profitability and ultimately the sustainability of the organization. I think that's me done. I, I don't want to overspend my time, but I hope that this has been an interesting, quick overview of the kind of thoughts that I have in my mind in terms of corporate governance for Africa, uh, corporate governance for South Africa, um, and how we will change the, the terrible position we are in right now and with 1% coming from the leadership, changing it to essentially make us the mecca of the world. I thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heck of an ask. And I think one very aspirational um, goal to try to shift. I do like this idea, though, of the 1%, that actually small changes can have a big impact. Indeed. And I suppose one of the challenges for us to confront, Terry, is that for many parts of Africa, the, um, the lawlessness that is associated with a lack of corporate governance has become de facto the way things are done. Now, we, we, that's not a politically correct statement to make, but it's a statement of fact, right? True. Um, true. So, so you're almost swimming against the grain when you're saying to people, doing it right is, is actually an important part of the doing it conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and also the recognition that there is an entire global illicit economy that is, that is bedrocked, really, on a lack of corporate governance and ethical business in the continent, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So I suppose the question, the question is, how do we change people's minds and people's perspectives? How do we, how do we get the tide to flow in the other direction? Well, see, I'm so pleased you asked that question. Um, and I, I'm going to respond this way. And I'm going to say to you, you know, I've been following, I, I, you know, I, I, don't really, I, I don't want to maybe mention a particular name right now for obvious reasons. I mean, you speak about being politically correct, and maybe we need to start being more truthful, which in itself becomes incorrect, politically speaking. Mm. But the point, the point that you ask, the, the first comment you say is a big ask, and I wonder whether or not it actually is as big an ask as what we, you and I, think it is, particularly if I attach 1% to it. 
if I asked you, or if I asked the leaders just for a small change today and another small change tomorrow, then it's not that big. But to your point, and, and now to your specific question, the informed institutional investors, the informed activists, which are these new X, Y, Z um, generation people, which are a lot younger than me, of course, um, I, I'm now heading towards 60, but the fact of the matter is their value systems are completely different to my values, and I guess yours too, Mr. And so when there are various activists that, that, that have millions of people following them, listening to them, and when those same activists replicate their fear on millions of informed institutional investors and activists of the environment, and they say, we're not so much worried of dying of old age, but we're more worried of dying because the resources of this globe are running out of fast. The first questions that are being asked is, why are we living in the pursuit of one capital only, and that being profit capital, when there are five other capitals that we have chosen to ignore? So what are the other capitals that today, in my mind, are absolutes, and really do we discuss these capitals and when we do discuss these capitals in our integrated reports, a worldwide phenomenon produced by most of the listed companies on all of the stock exchanges, as well as applicable to many of the government organizations across the, across the world, across the globe, the five capitals we are not paying sufficient attention on are, are human capital, number one, intellectual capital, number two, Natural and social capital, number three. Relationship capital, number four. Financial capital, number five. So when we start balancing, we see that capitals, surely, if we want to have a life that is balanced and sustainable, financial capital has got to be balanced with the remaining capitals I've just mentioned. And that's not going to come from you or from, well, maybe it won't come from me, maybe, you see, because I'm a bit older, all right? But we'll see if it'll come from you, younger generation, to say, here you make a fine point. Because I am worried, you tell me, like the younger generation, do we actually have a sustainable future on Earth? That would be my answer to you. Love it. Thank you, Terry. We'll come back to, to your thoughts and questions and comments and I would love to see the intersection of how ethics, governance, and capital play a role in a world that is becoming increasingly um, technological and in a world where there is a mash and, a, and a, 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 um, a collapsing almost of global values, what were cultural norms all of a sudden are becoming singularities in behavior. Thank you so much. To the, uh, to the uh, participants, again, if you're watching this conversation, please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot com. The code is 1620967. There you will find questions from our speakers, and we would love to get your feedback. Our final speaker, uh, before we break very quickly into our panel session, is going to be chatting to us in a few moments, Dr. Gabor Hege. He's coming in and he's going to be talking to us about impact branding from shareholder to stakeholders. Now, I'm particularly interested in this conversation, uh, Gabor. I have to tell you that my VC firm, we just won the best impact investment firm in Africa for 2020. So I'd love to hear all your thoughts about how impact and impact branding works. Um, uh, are you coming in from Budapest? Yes, at the moment, yeah. Vusi, thank you very much. Yeah, so you can I, hear me, yeah? We can, can you hear me? I have very, I have very fond memories of Budapest. I dated a beautiful young lady from Hungary many years ago. I am happy to hear that. So, <laughs> so first of all, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So congratulations, by the way, to your VC, yeah? Uh, to the success you achieved. Now, uh, welcome everybody. It's a great panel. Thank you very much to be part of. And... Uh, I want to share a few thoughts with you, which very much, much connects to what was said so far and what uh, actually Terry also explained. So, but I want to make it, you know, 
based on statements, you know, which you can, you know, debate, you can, you can add your thoughts. So I think it's out of a question that today we entered into an age of sustainability. Just imagine that in Geneva, for example, one of the key investment banks called Lombard ODA, which is a traditional Swiss investment bank, campaigns with the slogan, we are entering a sustainable revolution. Imagine a bank talking about a revolution. So this is critically important. Uh, just think that, uh, give you a, a bit of a history just to understand the corporate landscape. So when we entered business, you know, we are a strong corporate and financial and now sustainable and branding agency. So when we entered business, you know, more than 20 years ago, it was still the area of shareholders, shareholder value creation, all about shareholders. Some of you might remember these were the times, you know, when there were big stock exchange listings all over the world, privatizations, you know, and so on. So we thought that if you make shareholders happy, everything will be okay. Companies will grow, you know, everything will be fine, employees will be happy, and so on. It turned out that this Going for growth caused a lot of other problems, you know, including exploiting too fast or natural resources, you know, which you know very well, and a lot of other problems. So we came into an era now with climate change problems and all the other problems we are, we are fully aware of. We came into an area where companies should actually rethink everything. So, for example, Shareholders will be important, and they are important as one of the so-called stakeholder groups. But all the other stakeholders are important now, whether they are employees, whether they are your customers, whether they are smaller or bigger local communities around the company. So these, this is a big shift and a big change that companies with a purpose, they should care watch the interest of all of their stakeholders just to create a better world. Just bear in mind that we are, when we talk about customers, fine, you, uh, each company should provide good services, good products, this is obvious. But customers think, they have families, they have kids, whatever. Uh, they are much, much more aware now about any consequences that the climate change can cause or whatever. So they want to see companies that are really, or they do care about the future so this is the so-called shift from a shareholder focused company strategy to all stakeholders focused company strategy now uh, another point uh, when we want to explain why sustainability is the key key uh, 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 to, 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 to many things these days uh, as Wusi you correctly said you have to change if you want to make changes, and that applies also to corporate governance. It was clearly explained by Terry, but also applies to how to comply with sustainable issues and how to be more sustainable. This is also important to, to change people's mind, to change the boardroom mind. And one of the opportunities that it can work, that we see now, for example, that investors all over the place are, are actually uh, so-called forcing companies to go on this road. So there could be a lot of explain, uh, examples said about how uh, investment companies, and I think, Busi, you also have your own ideas on this, how you would require companies to, to actually to go more sustainable in order to secure the finances they would need for future growth. So I would say that when we talk about this change and changing and go more sustainable, this is unavoidable. Now, the question is how much it uh, helps the company brand and how much it helps the, the overall brand, let's say in case of Africa, to be more positive if the private sector and if companies show up more commitment to build a better world. And we think that this very much impact, have an impact on the overall brand. So let's say if the companies show that they are committed to build a better world, then this is a positive message today, uh, which people expect. So if it works for the whole sector or industries, then it definitely 
strongly adds to a better um, Africa brand and image. So when we come to the, the point, another term uh, uh, to explain to you, impact branding, which is actually with my one of my key colleagues, Paul McIntosh, we, we elaborated uh, uh, together a, a few years ago. Impact branding is a new service we provide, but we want to increase it, you know, the impact. So we, we, we want to actually to get, get this term uh, accepted by, by, by many. Uh, that, would, that means exactly that we help companies to bring sustainability into the brand value creation. And this is why it connects to the Africa brand as well. So if it's done well in the corporate sector, helps a better Africa brand uh, all over the place. So, which means that we are not only helping companies to, 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 get, into, uh, to get the sustainability issues into the corporate strategy. For example, uh, uh, explaining them the SDGs and how the SDGs can be uh, followed, you know, and how the SDGs can be incorporated into the corporate uh, behavior in the corporate strategy and, and, and once it's done and then there are results of this, then the results should be clearly communicated to, 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 to all stakeholders. And let me, let me tell you an example why, why I'm quite optimistic on this. With the UNDP, so the United Nations uh, uh, Development Programme, we co-partnered and helped them to organize and to, uh, to, to, to manage some of their key global events uh, yearly in Geneva, in Geneva. And uh, this, some of the key forums we did with them together was to bring together uh, young entrepreneurs who have sustainable solutions and started to build up their startup or their company uh, or uh, maturing, you know, in that field with investors who, uh, who, who so-called intend to invest into such companies. And I had the chance to meet good many African young entrepreneurs, great people, great guys, you know, they are committed. They really see, see a future in sustainable solutions. So uh, the, my impression with these discussions with them uh, on the location when we had these big forums, you know, uh, was very positive. So I think it can be done not only on a smaller, but on a big level. So big companies, as some of your companies are already doing it, big companies can also be ready to implement the sustainability issues, to implement many of the SDGs, so the sustainable development goals into their corporate strategy and actually live in that way. By the way, what Terry and also Wusi was mentioning about how to change people's mind and maybe be more fair, transparent, you know, and be more honest. Uh, that's a key issue everywhere in the world. But I think once if you make a decision on a board level, and that's corporate governance as well, that you want to follow this road to build a better world and you are a company with a purpose, just I, I would be interested later on in your opinion. I think that even this decision this change in strategy can create a better environment for being honest, for being transparent, and so on. So you see, it can help even to create a better environment simply because the, the, the overall objective, besides, of course, making, making good products and good services, is to serve the world, to serve the people around. And this is happening. So uh, maybe a few thoughts about, about communications and the role of communications. It, it is often emphasized that, uh, you know, people, of course, we need technology. We have the technology to grow more sustainable. Actually, we all know that there is finance available to grow more sustainable. And people think it's okay. No, that's the basics, of course. But once you do this and you have results, you have to communicate. Communication will, be, will play a key role in making the world a better place and more sustainable. Because if we don't focus on communications, people will learn slowly about your achievements. They will learn, learn not immediately. Uh, let, uh, so the point what I want to make is that if communication works properly, and of course it's it, all your all of the company achievements in this in this discipline in this region is being correctly communicated, then it doesn't only help the company to have a better brand, a better image, a better perception by all its publics. 
but it also shows an example to others to follow. And this is what we want. We want to others to follow. We need, we need discussions on this. We need communication on this. Otherwise, we will not be able to achieve, let's say, sustainable de uh, development goals, simply because there is no enough communication to speak about the achievements, the results, you know, the, the, the issues that to be, to be done. Give you a final example of what we are planning to do, and this, this of course, makes a lot of uh, this creates a lot of opportunity for, for communication professionals like us. For example, in Europe, uh, maybe you have heard, is the Adriatic Sea, which is, a, which is part of the bigger Mediterranean Sea. The Adriatic Sea is a semi closed sea, with, therefore, with a very delicate uh, uh, natural ecosystem. And the great history of old towns in you know, the is loved by, especially by European tourists, and I hope that there will be more people coming to see this place also from Africa. So it's a wonderful place, a wonderful place. However, millions of tourists flock there each year, and of course it's being industrialized, whatever. What we plan to do as a communication firm, we initiate and we are the leaders of a, of a partnership with other big companies, so corporate people, to make a trip through the Adriatic on a solar boat, which just works and operates only on solar, uh, and to go uh, on a trip uh, uh, entering to the key ports and having media discussions, not only on board, but also at the, port, at, at the stops and at the ports, with researchers, economic people, decision makers, who will explain they're thinking about how this region can go more sustainable in order to preserve it for the future, live. So they will be with us on the, on the boat. They will be interviewed on the boat while we are cruising, you know, around the places, islands and whatever. And they will illustrate the situation, whether they will talk about a change in agriculture, in fishing, in energy, and all sorts of stuff. So the point is that to make it a live event for five weeks, which means that they will, you know, different and different researchers will share their opinion to the public. At the ports, we will have, of course, big media events. Of course, there will be a strong social media campaign follow, uh, 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 I mean, following our trip. And what we want to achieve, and also we want to involve, of course, politicians, local decision makers. What we want to achieve is to, make, to have a big debate, a big discussion about the sustainable future of a region. Now, we got already very positive feedback about the participants, so we want to do it next year. But what is also important that from some international organizations, we also got the feedback, feedback that, guys, if you do it right, and if it works, we would like you to maybe to do it in different parts of the world, maybe Africa. So what I want to say is that, and probably this is the last what I wanted to emphasize, is that Communication should become very, I would say, very progressive, very active in campaigns, in actions, you know, in order to motivate everybody. And this is where, Wusi, I would come back to your comment a, a, a few couple of minutes ago that change people's minds. So they should see that this is exciting enough to get involved, exciting enough to think it over. Maybe that's the only way to go, as I said in the beginning of my speech. So I think that such actions, and we are looking very much forward to do it right, such actions can really make an impact. So, well, I would say that, that, that thanks for, for, for the time. And of course, I am very happy to take part in the discussion, Busi, and looking for your questions. But I think, I think I can end only with the same message that please do not forget that we are entering or we are in, in an age of sustainability, and everyone who connects to sustainability will create a more positive trend. So, thank you. Love it. Thank you so much, uh, Gabor. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, and what I'd like to do now is welcome the other panel uh, members. We um, do have some time still um, just for us to have a moderated conversation. And I just want to help us remember um, the landscape we've traversed over the past um, hour and 55 minutes. It's been that long. 
So we've spoken about startups and the difference between startups and SMEs. We've spoken about the need for us to create a more inclusive world and how startups can play a role in that environment. And I've also recognized the limitations of that. Then we moved from there and we spoke um, about continental integration and how do we integrate the economies of the continent so that we can achieve, uh, you know, how to pursue better rate of growth than we have seen perhaps over the past 100 or 200 years or so. Hanan came in with some macroeconomic data and we looked at some numbers that helped us really frame where the continent finds itself. We jumped very quickly then into corporate governance and the role that corporate governance can play. And then penultimately, uh, Saul spoke to us a bit about how do we reframe the way we see ourselves and the ball, the role branding can play in terms of impact. So we've come quite a way, and I'm aware that we've got one or two panel members who um, may no longer be able to join us. But for those of us that remain, I have one or two questions that should take particularly long. And um, I would like to start with you, Bosi, if you will allow me. Here's the question, and it's the beckoning question, which is this. Does all of this actually matter? And here's the reason I ask that question. Over the past 100 years or so, the global economic system has pivoted on a single link pit, which has been that capital generates sufficient return. And all of a sudden, we have focused our time and attention on adding to this periphery things like branding, things like inclusion, things like socioeconomic development. I, the question I'm asking is actually a very, very simple one. Does all of this matter? Or should we simply set about the business of letting business do business and letting economies take care of themselves? Thank you, Vusi. Uh, and I think the simple question, or rather the simple answer to your simple question is yes, it matters. Because I guess you would imagine if we were not in an environment where there is innovation, where there is integration, where there is evolution of things. And I think it is important, you know, that as leaders, we are therefore at the forefront of how do we actually um, get the best version of whatever system that we're operating within. You know, mm -hmm. you're speaking about the role or the traditional and orthodox role of business you know, which is making profit. But I guess in an environment where we find ourselves, let's agree that business has got a bigger responsibility than that of generating profit. And allow me to bring this back to the South African context, but I think this also is true for the broader African continent. You know, we are living in a country where we have just overtaken Brazil as one of the most unequal societies in the world. And yet you are sitting, you know, also in a country with the highest per capita concentration, you know, which is found in Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. So let's agree that such inequality cannot augur well, you know, for the uh, 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 integration that we're trying to achieve, you know, uh, both from an integration perspective, uh, from a continental perspective, and definitely from a global perspective. So I think there is a lot that we need to be answering, especially as business leaders, to say what therefore becomes the role of business, you know, in advancing the socio-economic transformation agenda. The reason, for instance, why we are hopping on this African continental free trade area and agreement is precisely because it is going to play a critical role in promoting, you know, the economic transformation for Africa. You know, it cannot be right that a continent as rich as Africa, you know, is sitting as one of the poorest continents, you know, in the world. It therefore says, from what we're doing as social partners, there is a serious imbalance and there needs to be something done to say, how do we therefore, you know, ensure that we leverage the playing field and we therefore, you know, uh, 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 achieve things in a more harmonious way, as it were. Ch Terry Poison raised a very important issue around financial capital actually you know, uh, cannot operate on its own. You know, there's the human capital, there's the social capital, you know, there is uh, 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 the relational capital that has to accompany it. And I think through the evolution of things, we have therefore learned 
you know, uh, the fact that we need all the six capitals, you know, to have an, a, a harmonious system and to actually achieve the balance that we need to achieve. So does it matter? It definitely does, uh, 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 see, and we need to be doing more of it as it were. Shiv, I want to come to you very quickly. There's a generation of businesses that are being created today that didn't exist. I'm old enough to remember a time when I sat in the boardroom and the things we do today whilst we're sitting in boardroom meetings were not even available. There was no WhatsApp, there was no Facebook, no Twitter, no LinkedIn. There is a generation today of these hyper successful, um, you know, with incredible market penetration, ridiculous amounts of market share, technological innovation businesses that have fundamentally shaped the way the world we, we live and works. And of course, everybody talks about the fans, but even if you come to the continent of Africa, we've seen our own um, technological innovations that have taken the world by storm. Here's the question I'm asking you. Do you get the sense that the builders of the economy of the future, these people building these businesses called startups, that in the next 15 years, and perhaps actually for a lot of them in less time, in the next 10 to 15 years will become the true market dominance. Are you getting a sense that they understand the importance of capital beyond financial capital? That they understand the importance of equity and equal distribution? That they understand the importance of socially conscious businesses that are part of the fabric of society? Uh, you're on mute, Shiv. Just unmute yourself. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> Not at all. Sorry. Um, thank you for the question, Busi. Uh, it's a great question. I am unfortunately not a great believer that the entrepreneurs who are leading some of these big corporations are going to, are going to suddenly uh, change their spots and believe that it's all about distributing everything equally and all the rest <laughs> of it. I think they're building platforms for us to use. And I think the critical question is how we use them. Mm -hmm. And the critical question is the consciousness of uh, 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 the young people and citizens around the world, um, you know, that have a new mindset, hopefully, that includes the SDGs, that includes a certain self-confidence about all of us being part of the human family in a very equitable manner. Hi, hi. Um, what's he? Can you hear me? Used in a certain way. At the end of we'll the day, these platforms are serving us. Hi, we'll see. Can you hear me? That they work in a certain way. I think they will. And if we, we can hear me, we will just stop using them. And I think you're starting to see that kind of okay. I'll try more uh, energy that can really change things. So it's really about us. It's not about these few entrepreneurs who have become, um, you know, mega wealthy by doing what they do. They've been very I mean, innovative. They've created <laughs> things, but we need to change that. In the sense, we need to use those platforms. Harness that energy. Harness, look at this conference. You know, we're all over the world talking to each other, connecting in a different way we could never have done some years ago. These are great technologies that if we use them well, we can do great things with them. And if we use them badly, we can do bad things with them. So I think it's about really us uh, rather than those few entrepreneurs changing the way they think. I hear you. I mean, I think that the idea that there is a perhaps a dispersion and a distribution of power today that is different to what it was 20, 30 years ago. You know, today, an upset consumer can post something on Twitter and bring an entire large organization to standstill. We've just had an incident here in South Africa where there was a particular ad that was flighted on a particular social media platform, and it became a huge issue for a large listed um, retail pharmaceutical business. So, so even that line, isn't it, between, between corporate and corporate governance, between uh, understanding your community and between delivering value, today has just collapsed into a singularity. And Terry, I want to bring you in here. In fact, before I bring you in, I want to chat to Sol a bit. So, Sol, how does it happen that in 2020, in Africa, Hi, Vusi. in South Africa, I mean, I, you know, I often laugh when Vusi, I hear can you hear me? Of mine who are CEOs of businesses in it's South okay. Africa. When they expand into the rest of the continent, we'll talk about our expansion into Africa. And I go, but Chief, you are in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the name of where you are is the word Africa. How do you not see okay, that you're a part of, of the continent? 
Well, what can we learn and what do we learn from, we don't need to mention the name of the company, but the incidences around which the way brand and brand communications has happened in the past yeah, is clearly not something consumers are going to sit problem. back anymore and yeah, take. So you, you there was a time because, yeah, when the conversation the between business one, and consumer, one, yeah. between market and market participant, was always dictatorial. Yeah. This is the question and this is the product. How? What do we learn today about this redistribution of power where consumers can actually take offense and choose to do something and it becomes a major political hotbed, even for a large business with a massive balance sheet that, that has, I would imagine, droves of people doing reputation management. But once that, that steamroll of fire takes over, it, it, it takes its own life. The question quite pointedly, and I'm going about it, let me ask you this. Do you think we need an exercise in the collective in the collective consciousness of business leaders driving businesses in Africa? One that's not just about the softer types of capital, but also one that's about helping them understand the context of the environment they're operating in. Fusi, can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much, Fusi. Uh, Fusi, 2012. Fusi, can you hear me? Uh, conducted a Fusi, can you hear me? How South African Fusi. companies are, are, are perceived across the continent. Because the concern then, particularly for, for the, the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, the intelligence that we gathered, I was working for DTI then, was that um, Africans, particularly your African consumers, uh, believed that South African companies were behaving like neo-colonial institutions across the country. And they were saying that even though in South Africa um, um, we do have labor rights and we have the NECLAG forum in which you have all the stakeholders uh, contributing to any labor laws we could be coming up with. But as soon as South African entities uh, left traveled out of our borders. They forgot, they forgot about the human rights culture, uh, which is entrenched in South Africa. And they became extremely exploitative. But whilst we, we believe that, um, the study came back and said, in fact, that is not necessarily true. That was the, the general uh, view. Hmm. The main problem that South Africa is dealing with, and I, my suspicion is that President Cyril Ramaphosa, as the chairperson of the AU, isn't sleeping over this problem. Is is xenophobic violence. In fact, um. The minute xenophobic violence erupts, your South African conglomerates like, like MTN will tell you about the difficulties they have encountered um, across the continent. Even though the president appointed three to five special envoys who traveled across the continent to communicate his message to presidents and prime ministers in various African countries. Uh, that message Sorry. didn't trickle down to ordinary consumers and citizens in those countries. So as a result, there's a, a, a whip lash against South Africa and in the continent. And I, in my previous life, I worked for the Houghton Growth and Development Agency, responsible for trade and investment promotion. And one of my targets was, was expansion, uh, supporting Houghton-based companies to expand into the continent. I was supposed to, to support 15 companies from Houghton 
and I only supported two at the end of the financial year. And when we found out the reason why, it was because uh, last year xenophobic violence erupted and all over uh, across the continent. Uh, people didn't want to touch South African uh, 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 brands in those countries. And colleagues have spoken about the power of, of, of social media. Uh, in government circles in South Africa, we classify that as unmediated communication. <laughs> then, then, um, you can't spin it. Yeah. <laughs> once, once your citizens, your consumers uh, decide to, to raise an issue attacking your brand, it, become, it goes viral and you can't contain it. And we have a number of, of case studies, uh, including your 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 insurance companies. In fact, my youngest brother-in-law just just three weeks ago, for the yoga, went to Raskin, which is considered one of the most peaceful cities in South Africa. Two weeks later, before he put his all the tracker, the car was stolen and the insurance refused to pay. Within a week, that, that post on Facebook had gone viral, and everybody, not only in South Africa, but across the continent, were already talking about that. Now, mm. my take is that that insurance company is going to struggle to even enter your, your African market. But um, South Africans, I spoke about Ngugi Wachiongo talking about decolonizing our mind. Hi. In fact, um, in those guys who are here, if um, we're going to go for lunch, because the next session starts at 1. I upstairs. celebrated when Zimbabwe. They're going to finish, they're going to finish in Africa any minute now. But obviously, it um, a shock let's cover them. South Africans. Because all along, South Africans believe that um, we were the superpower in Africa in all respects until they were clobbered by Zimbabwe. And it's then that they realized that, in fact, we are not as good as we thought. Yes, I know right now Nigeria may say they are the biggest uh, economy in the continent. To respond to that, we say we are the most sophisticated. That, that's how indigenous South Africans are. But the reality is that we are not as good as we believe we are. And for us to be able to access uh, the 1.3 billion consumers across the continent. We have to humble ourselves and to make sure that we respect all these African countries as we enter them. In the same way as we expect each and every foreign company that comes into, into our country to respect our norms, our standards, and to a large extent to even give us meaningful shareholding to show that we are able to control those foreign yeah. interests. This is the same uh, yeah. approach to adopt when we go into African countries. Got you. Thank you for that. Terry, I want to come to you very quickly, and I'm cognizant of time. So um, this conversation about stakeholders and how do we rope stakeholders in, one of the truths about stakeholders actually is that a stakeholder environment has a deep and long memory. Um, and so, and so the truth about a lot of the things that we're talking about today is that the incentive for good corporate governance seems to be market participation. The punishment, though, can absolutely be deadly, right? So in other words, if you get good corporate governance, it doesn't necessarily mean your business is going to be successful in the long term. It just means you've got good public governance. There are a myriad of other issues that you still have to consider that determine your long-term success. But for sure, if you have bad corporate governance and it leaks, then that is definitely the death nail. If you were to summarize it for me, what do you think is the one thing business managers and business leaders need to keep top of mind as it relates to corporate governance, particularly in the rest of the continent? Sure, Chris, that's a tough one. 
I couldn't agree with you more. Um, at the centre of the digitised corporate governance framework, ironically, written well before one of the world's most um, notable governance codes, King 3, King 4, which he, um, which he would tell you that as well, is stakeholder engagement and stakeholder communication. It's the absolute centre of every organisation's governance framework, or at least should be, and sadly it's not. So um, I've just posted you a comment, in fact, on exactly that point, saying that consumers have a very, very long memory, and um, I don't think we've really given ourselves, um, I, I, how do I put this, I think we're too forgiving as stakeholders in South Africa. I cannot speak for the rest of Africa, and I certainly can't speak for the rest of the world. But if you look at, for example, and I'm going to go outside of Africa right now, if you look at maybe VW and the scandal, the emission scandal on VW, I'm going to use another example. If I think of Deloitte, if I think of KPMG, why are they still around? Why are they still around? Should they still be around after the incredible damage that they've caused society? And in my opinion, the answer is no. How many times do you forgive them? How many times do you forgive them? So at the end of the day, I come back to an earlier point. Our informed institutional investors and stakeholder communities who are informed, and let's not for one minute believe that uneducated people aren't informed of poor governance practices. They very much are, all right? I think as this new board, the new wave comes into our new boardroom, and what I mean by the new wave and the new board is the younger generation. First see, there's gonna come a time, I'm mortal, I'm gonna die, and so will you. I'll probably die before you. And as I'm getting older, somebody else is going to have to take my place in my boardroom, in the boardrooms of which I sit and which I occupy. We all know that their thinking and their value systems are very, very different. And we really are seeing this kind of this, this tussle between old versus new thinkers. And the new people, the newer generations coming through, are all focused on stakeholder community uh, driven initiatives that the collective win, not at the cost of one. And that's my answer. And, okay. you know, my frustration is that we've still got, now I don't want to use my real thinking around what, what, what is really happening, but we've still got a table of, 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 of directors who seem to think that they are untouchable and that they're invincible. They are not. And that's my message. The stakeholder will will drive new value thinking, new new philosophies, new beliefs. We see that really with COVID-19, things are not the same and never will be. There's this new normal that's not normal, and we're all going to have to cope with that. And I can tell you, and, and I'm sorry I've got some support from my colleague, we'll see this now, the six capitals are fundamental. And when we talk about corporate governance, we're not talking about the compliance or the tick boxing to some governance code. That is not, in fact, that is just a very small component of what corporate governance is really about. Remember that codes, these codes written across the world, including legislation and regulation, all they are and all they nearly are, are supposed to do is just give us a parameter, a guideline to being better performers, better behaviors, so that the collective can benefit. The stakeholders, I don't believe we've given them enough, uh, enough, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Helping out any of my colleagues. We haven't given them enough. Um, we, we have, we've underestimated their power. Mm. We have underestimated, I can't find the right word, but we have underestimated the power of institutional investors that are informed, of the power of activism. We've underestimated them. And I can tell you, they're not coming, they're here already. Lovely. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to uh, ask you to close for us. I'm under a lot of pressure from the uh, organizers to wrap this conversation up. Um, and, and we'll see. Here's the question I, I have for you, and it's just a final question. So an estimated billion jobs needed on the planet over the next 10 years, 8% of the world's population controlling 83% of global wealth as we speak. You've spoken very eloquently about the fragility of the global supply chain, the need for localization of manufacturing, the need for regionalization of trade and industry. And above all of this, COVID has gifted us 
fiscal deficit in many parts of the continent, double deficits in others, sectors most affected, of course, we've already spoken about, and we're projecting a loss of between 20 and 30 million jobs just over this COVID period alone. Here's my final question for you. If I'm a business leader watching the conversation, what do I need to know and do following the conversation to make sure that I'm a positive part of the change? Thanks, Buti. I think let's agree, and probably maybe if we, have, if we haven't acknowledged this as business, then I guess let's acknowledge that the role that we have to play as business being the only social partner hmm. with disproportionate resources and maybe a disproportionate voice that means that we have a critical role to play in influencing and in contributing to the economic trajectory of the continent. I spoke about earlier on the fact that our role as business needs to extend beyond just, as Terry said, that of financial capital and being interested in the business of business. One of the days, you know, where that narrow thinking was accepted. I think in the South African context in particular, the social uprising that we have seen, you know, mm. is probably giving us that message as business that more is expected from you. You know, and I think it will be naive, Busi, if we were to think that our role, I think, only is restricted to that, you know, role of business. Because in my mind, if we were to be obsessed about sustainability, then you are actually obsessed mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. investing in your own future market. You know, because mm -hmm. if we were to drive unapologetically this notion of socioeconomic transformation, of, of, or, or rather of ensuring that we level the playing field, then you are actually ensuring that you are doing the right thing so that uh, your business can also survive. Because in this environment of domestic inequality, it leads to social instability. And where there is social instability, then the environment within which you are operating as business is also affected. So mm -hmm. what therefore becomes the role, you know, of business in contributing to that, you know, uh, conducive environment and to that social stability. And we mm -hmm. will be naive to think that it is the problem of government and news flashes that it is not. You know, because if government fails, then the country fails. And if we fail as countries, then the continent fails. And if the continent fails, then business fails. So mm -hmm. we therefore have to realize that link and understand that what we ought to bring to the table is much more bigger than what we've been bringing to the table up until this point as business. Love it. Thanks. Thank you all so much for your conversations, your thoughts. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would have loved to carry on this conversation more, but I, of course, we all have telling diaries and Please. above that, we have a limitation of time. Um, Gabor, uh, Shiv, Terry, Sal, Mr. Siwa, and in her absence, Hanan, thank you all so much for your time. We appreciate it. Back to you in studio. I've always wanted to say this. I always wanted to be like a reporter. <laughs> back to studio. So back to you in studio. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. 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 Bye-bye.